So the horse stance is a fundamental position from Chinese martial arts. This is a low to the ground wide stance that can be used as an isometric hold for training. But its application goes far beyond martial arts. It can be extremely useful for everyone from gym goers to athletes to anybody else who just wants to improve the way they feel and the way they move. That said, the precise benefits you get from the horse stance are gonna vary a little bit, depending on precisely how you perform it, what your goals are, and which technique you use. You'll find there's lots of different explanations about how to perform the horse stance. So in this video, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of the horse stance, the different types of horse stance, how I like to perform the horse stance, and how you should perform the horse stance. The horse stance is something that I've reintroduced into my training in the last six months or so. I'm still not very good. I can only do like two minutes at a time or a little bit more than that, but I'm shaking all over the place. And in just a matter of months, I've really started to notice a difference. It's easier for me to get in and out of a deep squat. I have more mobility and flexibility for kicks and for things like Cossack squats. And I have less pain and more stability in my lower back, better engagement of the core and the glutes. I've been doing some other corrective exercises for my lower back and for my mobility in this area, as I've been discussing in recent videos. So I can't say it's entirely due to the horse stance, but it's definitely played a big role. In the past, I've done Tai Chi and Karate. Both of those incorporated the horse stance as a key part of their training, but with subtle variations. So obviously in the horse stance, what you're doing is you're standing with your legs wide apart in a lower stance, like I said. What this is doing is opening up the hips. So you're strengthening your abductors and stretching the adductors. But you're doing this in a very active manner. So you're not just building flexibility in a passive way. You're building strength and stability in those ranges of motion, which means you can more easily get down into a deep squat. This is really important because changing height and level is an essential part of many athletic pursuits. And a lot of us just don't have this ability. In fact, this can be so good for developing mobility, you can actually use the horse stance by progressively getting wider to build up to a middle splits. There's actually a great video on this, a very old video from Daniel Vadnall at Fitness FAQs. Highly recommend checking that out. At the same time though, by sitting in this position and holding it there for sometimes minutes at a time, what you're doing is you're developing strength and strength endurance in that area. This is fantastic for strengthening the glutes, strengthening the hamstrings, strengthening the quads, even the core. And because you're sitting in this stretched position and resting essentially on your tendons, it's brilliant for strengthening and developing the tendons as well. What you're doing here when you're training your hip mobility, it's not just about hip abduction and being able to raise your leg to the side, it's also about external rotation. Get down really deep into a body weight astagrass squat and then as you stand up, if you find it's actually quite hard to drive up from the bottom of the squat there, that might be because your external rotation is lacking. And this can be a limiting factor in back squats as well, weighted squats. With all these different benefits, it's important to decide what your focus focuses with the horse stance and then to choose the right horse stance for you because like I said there's different versions and if you watch a few videos on YouTube about how to do the horse stance you're gonna find they all tell you something slightly different and this isn't because you know one of them's wrong it's because there are legitimately different methods with different outcomes so if we go back to those traditional Chinese Kung Fu roots then you have your northern style and your southern style so your northern styles of Kung Fu are generally much lower to the ground using wide stances acrobatic flying kicks these include styles such as praying mantis and eagle claw and and yeah, they look pretty flamboyant. And as such, they use a much deeper and wider horse stance in training. In general, again, there are different sub-styles and it all depends on the goals and what you're using the horse stance for. Then you have your southern styles of Kung Fu, your Wing Chun's, etc. These are slightly more upright with the feet turned slightly outwards. This places less emphasis on mobility, but allows you to generate more power by twisting other martial arts have since also adopted the horse stance in various different forms. In karate, in Wadawiri karate, we used to call it kibadachi. It was a wider stance with outwards turned toes. So yeah, there's lots of different versions of the horse stance depending on what you want to achieve. And as we'll see, you can modify it however you like to get the benefits that you want. So how high or low you use the horse stance is gonna depend on which style you're imitating and what the benefits you want are. And we'll talk about why you might use a higher stance in a moment. Of course, it's also gonna depend on your mobility and your strength. You might be limited and only able to get into a slightly higher stance. But a great starting point that a lot of people use is the five-step horse stance. So start with your feet together, then turn your heels out, then turn your toes out, then turn your heels out, then turn your toes out, and then sit down into it. So we're gonna count that sitting down as the last step. This is gonna get you into a good starting position and if it's a bit too hard, then of course you can go narrower. If it's a bit too easy, then you can go wider over time. 
but if you aim to hold this for about 30 seconds to begin with, train this about three times a week, and over time you'll find it gets easier, and you should be able to start adding 10 seconds on here and there, either every week or maybe every fortnight. And as you do, you're gonna get to higher and higher times. Alternatively, if you're more interested in building that mobility, working up to a side split, then you can increase the width instead. What you wanna do if you're working on mobility and strength in particular is to make sure that your thighs are parallel to the ground, so you don't wanna be like this. Obviously, if you do go like this, that's fine as well, but you're not gonna be building the strength and mobility to the same degree. And if you're not sure if you're deep enough, what you can do is grab a stick, lie it across your hips here, and if it rolls off, then you're not deep enough if it stays upright, then you're fine. Now, one of the things that can vary depending on who's teaching you the horse stance is whether you want to face the toes forwards or slightly outwards. If you're facing the toes directly forwards, then this is going to help you to engage the glutes in particular and the quads. If you face them slightly outwards, this is going to further externally rotate the femurs, making it slightly more of a mobility challenge. Both of these things are completely fine and you will get the same benefits from each, it's just one will slightly favour one, one will slightly favour the other. You might find that if you're slightly limited in mobility, you struggle slightly to get your toes pointing directly forwards and so you have to keep them pointing outwards by necessity. Speaking of which, it's also important to consider your footwear and I think that for this, then once again, barefoot training is by far the best way to go. If you look at how Kung Fu practitioners would train, they train in pumps or plimsolls. I just think it's really useful training the horse stance as incidental training. That means sneaking it into your lifestyle, doing things like getting to horse stance whilst you're doing your teeth or washing your hands. And if you wear barefoot shoes, then you're using the same posture and the same foot position during brushing your teeth and doing those things as you are when you practice it out and about. So this is another good reason to use barefoot shoes. And if you're wearing shoes with heels on though, it's gonna tip you slightly forwards and alter that center of gravity. It's also going to slightly alter the position of your pelvis. So these subtle changes will negatively impact on the way you perform the movement. That brings me to today's sponsor, which is Vivo Barefoot. In my opinion, Vivo Barefoot make the very best barefoot shoes for a whole host of reasons, because they're ethically sourced, because they fit really well, they're really comfortable, they're highly durable, and they have a fantastic range of different shoes, whether you want to do trail running, whether you're looking for something to wear to the gym, or whether you're looking for something to wear just around town. One of my favorite things about these shoes, though, is that you literally can wear them doing literally anything. Obviously, your foot is designed to go barefoot, so once you're adapted to it, this is the perfect footwear for every occasion. I find that they do look nice enough, smart enough to wear to a nice event or so I don't feel odd when I'm dropping my daughter off at preschool. But at the same time, I can then wear them straight into the gym where the flat heel is perfect for weightlifting, have that nice solid connection with the ground. And if I want to practice calisthenics, it's ideal. Or I can wear them somewhere like this to go trail running or to perform martial arts. As you guys know, I've been wearing barefoot shoes for years and for most of that, it's been Vivo Barefoot. Just because they last so long, they're so comfortable. I just really love these shoes. So if you want to give them a try yourself, then you can use the code BIONEER15, the link in the description down below, and you'll get 15% off your first order. Thanks again massively to Vivo Barefoot for sponsoring this video, and now on with the show. I did not appreciate how many bugs there are going to be here today. Do I really smell that bad? Another point of contention is your pelvis. Should you have a slight anterior pelvic tilt, posterior, or should you keep it neutral? Well, most people will tell you to keep your pelvis neutral and your spine neutral. You wanna make sure you're standing straight upright and not leaning or bending over forwards. It's easy to do this whilst thinking you're straight, so it can be useful to do it against a wall or to check in a mirror and to really learn what that feels like so you can make sure you're up straight when you're doing it on your own. But in terms of the pelvis, Keeping it neutral can help you to maintain that upright neutral spine and to engage the core, but there are some that say that a slight posterior tilt, tucking your tailbone underneath, can actually help you to better root yourself to the ground. Here you're creating something similar to a hollow body position. On Jesse Enkamp's channel, which is a fantastic martial arts channel that I highly recommend, there's a video where he goes to train at the Shaolin Temple Europe with Sifu Shi Heng Yi. Today, I'm training with a Shaolin master and he talks about maintaining a slight round posture, which is essentially a hollow body, by slightly tucking in the tailbone and by protracting the shoulder blades slightly. 
This allows him to then redirect energy pushed against his hands back into the ground rather than toppling over. A slight alteration to his posture that completely changes his structure. This to me is fascinating and it's called rooting. And by rooting yourself to the ground, you can just generate so much more power because obviously so much of our power comes from that ground reaction force, whether sprinting by pushing off the ground or throwing a punch. If you're not stable on the ground, you can't generate power and project it outwards. As for the arms, there's a number of things you can do with these. Generally, the advice is to keep them nice and relaxed. And you can do this by holding them out in front of you like this, as though you are holding a beach ball. And you're supposed to keep them nicely relaxed, which means broken elbows, broken wrists, no tension in the shoulders. And what you're doing here is training yourself to be tense and strong in the legs whilst being relaxed in the upper body. This kind of relaxation allows you to create more efficiency. If you want to last longer in this position, and it does become a test of endurance, then if your whole upper body is contracted and tensed as well, you're going to run out of energy much more quickly. You're going to get uncomfortable much more quickly. By keeping the upper body relaxed, you can thereby maintain that stable position for longer. This translates to martial arts where the whole idea is to stay nice and relaxed and light until that moment of impact. So something that I need to work on. I'm not very good at relaxing my body. So yes, yeah, a really fantastic option. A similar option is to practice flowing arm movements like something from Tai Chi, if you've ever done something like that. Same kind of principle applies here. Or at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you can practice your punches, making this more of a full body exercise, or drawing your fists back to your sides, back to your hips, in order to really reinforce those movement patterns. This, like dropping your hands by your side, also makes the movement a little bit harder, because when your hands are out in front of you, they act as a counterbalance. What I like to do is this position, I do that because it's what Jackie Chan does. And the final piece of the puzzle is what you're gonna do with your mind. And this is actually a really important focus. So recently I made a video saying how cold showers weren't all they're cracked up to be for developing discipline. I think if you really want to develop discipline and get all these benefits at the same time, then the horse stance is a fantastic option. Because as you push through those higher times, you're gonna to need to really push through those pain barriers. And the way to do this actually is to relax your body, to breathe gently through the nose in a rhythmic manner. This is going to reduce the sensation of pain from the buildup of metabolites in the legs and the working muscles. But the more you relax, the easier it is to get through this and that's an important lesson for life and again here we're controlling our central nervous system if you want to get better at doing tough stuff then exercise like this is a fantastic option some people use this as a form of standing or moving meditation to try and quiet the mind in that position whilst they maintain it and this is where you might want to stand up a little bit higher because now the focus isn't obviously on building strength and mobility to the same degree but you still get those a little bit i really like this option for meditating because i'm a parent and when i try and meditate sitting down I so often fall asleep, which is a real problem. But perhaps for me, what I think is the most useful thing to do during the horse stance is to focus on your structure, on your position, because there's so much to remember here. You need to think about the position of your pelvis. You need to think about your center of gravity. Are your legs even? Mine often aren't. You might even notice in some of these clips because I've got some imbalances, particularly in my right ankle, which I badly broke. You need to focus on your breathing and remaining calm. You need to engage your core. You need to keep your back nice and upright. And by focusing on these things, you can build a stronger structure, a better foundation for all movement. And this is what we mean when we say internal internal work, focusing internally to really work on those aspects of performance and technique that you don't see on the outside, and that's what's often really important. Also, if I'm being really honest, a lot of the time I just watch real junk on YouTube. So I hope you found this video useful, interesting guys. Let me know down below, do you do the horse stance and what is your record time? I bet you can easily beat mine. Have you noticed any benefits from training with it? Either way guys, thanks so much for watching this one and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.